Phil Paul, a member of a church in Whittier, California, went on a weekend uh, summer retreat with uh, his community group, about 12 of them. The second morning they went out uh, on a hike and they came upon a cascade in a lush ravine. Uh, the rocks were smooth from, for who knows, years, the water falling on them and leaving a, a microscopic uh, coating of algae. It was treacherous to get across and as Bill inched his way across, his feet went out with front, from under him and went head over heels and he landed his back of his head on an outcropped rock. He knew he was seriously injured as he uh, feel himself uh, going in and out of consciousness. His group uh, pulled him out of the water and uh, they began to pray for him. Their pastor had been talking about supernatural power like we are. And that God, uh, just like he raised Jesus from the dead, can still raise people uh, today. And so they prayed, Lord, please bring him back to life. Don't let him die. And uh, as they were praying, uh, Bill had this uh, experience that he knew, he felt like he had a choice to live or die. He was in a dark tunnel, and at the end was a bright light, and he said, Lord, I'm not ready to die yet. And just then he came back uh, to life, and... Um, uh, the, his group was, was thrilled and uh, he, he put his hand behind his head and he had a bump there about the size of a grapefruit. And so later that day they prayed for that and it went away totally. He was healed. So what do you think? A coincidence? A medical anomaly? Or a miracle? George Barna did a study in 2015, found that 67% of Americans believe uh, miracles happen today. 38% say they have experienced a miracle. That would be 94 million Americans. Have you seen that kind of supernatural power in your life? Can you? I believe you can. You can experience God's supernatural power in your life. Speaking of miracles, Jesus said, whoever follows me will do the works I do and greater works than these they will do because I'm going to my Father. Jesus taught that we would do miracles like he did because when he returned to his Father, he was sending us the Holy Spirit. Jesus' words were uh, fulfilled in the book of Acts when uh, Jesus ascended to heaven, then he sent the Holy Spirit on the apostles, probably on all 120 of the believers gathered in the upper room, and they preached boldly about the resurrection, and like 5,000 people became believers within a couple weeks. And uh, Acts tells us that the apostles did signs and wonders, and then they spread out and they took the gospel all around the world. So we have over 2 billion people today that are believers. I mean, that spread of that good news is supernatural. Why don't we see more of God's supernatural power today? Pastor and author A.W. Tozer wrote, read this with me. Many of us Christians have become extremely skillful in arranging our lives so that we can get on well enough without divine aid while at the same time ostensibly seeking it. We boast in the Lord, but watch carefully that we never get caught depending on him. We can be Christians, yet never depend on the supernatural power of God. This is the second in a series of messages called, Have You Seen God's Supernatural Power Lately? I'm asking, why don't we see more of God's supernatural power? Um, and I'm suggesting that if we begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, since he's the son of God and supernatural, we're going to experience supernatural in our lives. For our instruction, we're looking at the Old Testament prophet Elisha. If you want to follow along our text today, it'll be 2 Kings. If you want to use the Bibles under the seats, it's going to be on page 365. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slave. 
So this is a, a, a man from the company of the prophets, probably young. Uh, and uh, he, he dies and leaves behind a widow and two boys. And, the, and, and a lot of debt. And the creditor comes and uh, is going to take the two boys if she can't repay. Uh, the text doesn't suggest the creditor is a villain. In the Mosaic Law, it said if you can't pay your debts, you and your children uh, have to work your debt off with the creditor. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Uh, the Hebrew word for oil suggests that she has a flask, a small flask of oil. When Elisha learned this, he told her to go around and, and get as many jars as you can. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, this is, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. So what can we learn from this miracle about how we can experience more of God's supernatural power in our lives? I find four things. First, God's supernatural power is often shown in the small details of our lives. One thing that stands out for me in this miracle is that God concerns himself with a parent insignificant person uh, in Israel and her problems. In the grand scheme of things, why should God be concerned about a poor widow? The God who maintains the stars and the planets, does he have time to care about a mother and her finances? Yet that's exactly what we find here. In fact, we find the same thing as we read through 2 Kings. Elisha meets the needs supernaturally of many people and seemingly insignificant problems. In chapter 6, Elisha pours, uh, performs a miracle for a uh, seminary student who carelessly loses an axe head in the Jordan River. I mean, could anything be less important in the history of uh, Israel than finding an axe head in the river? We learn from these miracles that God cares about the smallest details of our lives. Well, that makes sense. If he controls the whole universe, then he has to control all the parts. A few years ago, Jory and I were cleaning our beach house in Michigan, and it was uh, just about an hour before... Uh, we were to get in our rental car for the airport and I realized I had lost the car key. So I immediately prayed for God to help me and we had immediate crisis because we had a flight to catch. I said, God, can you help me find it? I, I try to always do that, not just rush around and tearing all over the house looking for something, but to ask God to help me. And then I began to think, and I always try to do this, when did I have it last? And uh, I remembered that about an hour earlier, I had felt something hit my leg and uh, make a sound on the ground, and I realized I had a hole in my pocket. And so I went outside to about that spot, and then I realized I had another problem. It was all covered with ivy. So finding the key would be like finding a key in a haystack. So again, I prayed, God, we got to leave for the airport. You got to help me. Would you please? And within about a minute, I saw the sun shining on something shiny, and I found the key. I mean, I have had all kinds of experiences like that where God has helped me with little things. And that makes sense. Jesus says to ask him for daily bread. He wants to be involved in the smallest details in our lives. If you learn to pray for little things, you're going to experience more of God's supernatural power. Now, maybe you think I'm trying to lower the bar on what constitutes supernatural power. Instead of talking about raising people from the dead and healing people of cancer, I'm talking about finding keys. 
Now, I grant you, healing someone of blindness or some terminal illness is way bigger than finding your, your keys. Uh, I'm for both. I believe that God has the power and that we can raise people from the dead. We can pray and have people healed of big illnesses. But we should also pray for the little stuff. I mean, let's face it. Most of our lives are made up of little things. If we only pray about the big things, we're essentially removing God from most of our life. So if we invite God into the small problems we have throughout a day, we're going to see more of God's supernatural power. Second, many times God shows his supernatural power through us and through what we have. God asked the widow, what do you have? Why did he ask that? I mean, why didn't he just send her a, a wealthy person and, she, and he gives her a handful of cash? Problem solved. I think he asked her for that because he wants to typically work through us and through the resources we have. One of the reasons I think he does that is in that process, we strengthen our faith. I think the whole time the, the woman and her sons were out getting these jars and the whole time they're pouring the oil, their faith is being strengthened. I hear one of her sons saying, Mom, look, the oil is still pouring. It's incredible. When Elisha asked her what she had, her first reaction was, I don't have anything. And then she remembered she had a small flask of oil. She must have found it incredible that God could use the little she have and multiply it to meet all of her needs. Disciples had a similar experience, faced with 15,000 hungry people out in the country far away where there's no food. They wondered how they could feed all these people when they only had five small loaves, about like this, and two fish. Uh, but Jesus showed them that with him, he could multiply what they had to meet all these people's needs. I had experience like that. When I was going through seminary, things were very tight for me financially. Uh, I had to depend on God from, from dollar to dollar. I worked on Young Life student staff, uh, which meant while I was going to graduate school, I was also working in Young Life. And uh, many of the teenagers I worked with, they got more in their allowance than I got in my paychecks. And so, God, you got to help me. And every dollar went to paying for uh, you know, seminary and my basic necessities. But I got through graduate school debt-free. And I had enough money to buy a ring for jewelry and to take us on our honeymoon. It wasn't much of a honeymoon, but uh, my dad was a pilot for United Airlines, so he got us tickets to Maui and Honolulu. But I had to take care of the hotel and the food. So I got a cheap little crummy hotel in Kahului. I mean, nobody stays on that side of the island. I'm not even sure they have beaches over there. Uh, so, I, and Jory wasn't too impressed. I mean, her father was the president of a plastics company. They had lived well, uh, but it's all I had. And uh, so every morning we'd get up, we'd leave our dive, and we'd drive across to the west side to the Wailea beaches or Canapali beaches. We'd spend the day there. We'd shower in their outdoor showers. And then we'd get dressed in their, you know, uh, lobby restrooms. And then we'd have dinner and then we'd drive back to our little hovel. <laughs> when we got back, we went to the bank to combine our checking accounts. And the guy said, you want to put it in her account or your account? I said, well, whichever one has the most. He came back laughing. He says, you, Ron, have 72 cents. She has over $10,000. I knew that. <laughs> but I learned that God, as I depended on him, could meet all my needs. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he wasn't just interested in feeding people. He also wanted to develop the faith of the disciples, where they could see him working through them. He asked Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? John says, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Uh, Jesus and the disciples were in a deserted place out in the country. There are no stores around there, and they had all these people. Uh, he was teaching to 5,000 people plus wives and children, so we estimate about 15,000 people. And I picture Philip pulling the disciples together and saying, hey guys, we got a problem. Jesus started teaching like at 
10 a.m. He's still going strong at 5 p.m. He doesn't have a clue how many people we have here, what time it is, and what a problem it's developing. We got to clue him in. So they come up alongside Jesus and say, Psst, Jesus. Jesus says, one moment, beloved. And he asks the disciples when they tell him their problem. And Mark tells us, he says to Philip, you feed them. I mean, Philip is absolutely shocked. He doesn't have a clue how he's going to do this. And then Andrew comes up and says, well, we got one boy here that has a little, a little happy meal of five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus says, well, have the people sit down. And then he multiplies the food and uh, the disciples begin to take it in and out, kind of like yo-yos. And they're, they're going as fast as they can. And every time they deliver food, people are saying, hey, where'd you get all the bread and fish? And in the process, they're learning that with Jesus, their little can be multiplied to meet all these needs. Our faith grows stronger when we realize God works through us and with what resources we have. We play a significant role in God's kingdom. Third, God's supernatural power is often an expression of God's compassion. You're going to see more of the supernatural when you understand this. The reason Elisha helped this woman was not just to strengthen her faith and have the people of Israel see that God's power now rested on Elisha, but it was just out of compassion, this poor woman. She's about to lose her family. Uh, Jesus did the same thing. Most of his miracles are acts of compassion. He didn't do them to prove to anybody that he was the son of God. In the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000, Mark tells us when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was trying to get away alone to a deserted place, but he didn't mind that people stormed out to, to find him. He wasn't irritated. He loved them. Jesus is filled with compassion. I think you'll see more supernatural power in your life when you understand this principle. It's throughout the Bible that God is a God of compassion. He's merciful to you. Most of the time when I pray, that's the way I pray. Jory's been pretty sick in the last month with, you know, sore throat and cold and lung, respiratory stuff. And every night I pray for her and I pray, God, would you please heal her? Just because you're compassionate. You're merciful. Finally, demonstrations of God's supernatural power increase as our faith increases. Elisha told the woman to go look for jars. And he says, don't ask for just a few. If she asked for just a few, then she would have only gotten a little oil. If she gathered a lot, she would get a lot of oil. I picture her sons and, and her going around and maybe the sons she sent off to the marketplace to any vendors, you have some extra jars and she went to the neighbors. I imagine they clean the pots before, before pouring oil into them. A few years ago, our family went to uh, Hawaii and uh, for spring break and uh, our son, we were playing cards, and our son Luke uh, got up to get himself a bowl of yogurt. And he was eating it, and he's saying, ooh, this yogurt is terrible. And I, uh, I said, well, I couldn't imagine there's anything wrong with the yogurt. And so I said, where'd you get your bowl? He says, there on the counter. I said, oh. Well, that day, Luke, Joel, and Mark had been surfing, and Joel had gotten some coral in his foot, and maybe sea urchins, so Jory had poured a bowl of vinegar for him to soak his foot in. And when they're done, I threw it out, and I just set the bowl on the counter. That was the bowl Luke chose to uh, get. So I hope this lady cleaned out these jars before she uh, poured the oil in them. When they saw the oil miraculously pouring out, they must have been amazed. I hear one of her sons saying, Mom, the oil's still coming. This is incredible. And they must have been glad they had a lot of jars. <coughs> the miracle increased in proportion to their faith in how many jars they got. We see more miracles when we have more faith. 
When Jesus came to his hometown of Nazareth, the people did not believe him. They couldn't believe a hometown boy could be the son of God. Mark says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He cannot do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. When we don't have faith, God doesn't do miracles. Why? Because he won't get any credit. We won't give him any credit. You can experience God's supernatural power. Seeing God's supernatural power in your life makes for an amazing life. With Billy Graham's death, we see a lot of stories coming out on the internet, people's experiences with him, and one goes way back to 1945. A man named Cliff and his fiance wanted to get married, but they didn't have any money, or not very much, kind of like what I was when we got married. And uh, um, uh, he was invited to, uh, he was a young uh, associate pastor and he was invited to do a revival. And so they thought with that, uh, plus the money they did have, that'd be enough where they could pull off a honeymoon. So they got two train tickets, went to this city they'd never been to before, and uh, they got to their hotel, and the hotel had been taken over by the military for a rehabilitation center. So what are they going to do? They just have, you know, very little money, and uh, so what to do? But uh, they hitched a ride on the highway. Guy picked them up. He says, where do you want to go? I said, well, we don't really know. They, told, they explained, uh, you know, their predicament. And he said, well, I know a lady, maybe they can help you. She has a grocery store, a couple of rooms she rents out above. And so took her there, took them there. And uh, so for $5 a day, she would uh, let them stay. And um, so the next morning, uh, the, the, the fiance, uh, or the, the, the wife uh, began playing the piano and Cliff pulled out his trombone and began to play and she realized as she was listening to them that they were Christians. So she suggested another home, a better home where they could stay and so for the rest of their honeymoon they stayed with uh, another uh, Christian and um, uh, he said to them on the second day, you know, there's a young evangelist coming through town. Would you like to go to that tonight? And they said, okay. So they got there and the, uh, the person who was supposed to lead the music that night was sick. So they asked him if he would sub in and so he did. And that began a long relationship between Cliff Barrows and it was the young evangelist Billy Graham. And if you know much about Billy Graham, you know that Cliff and Billy uh, worked for the Graham Association for uh, years and uh, Cliff and Billy Graham uh, did thousands of crusades together. God was supernaturally involved bringing these two men together. Look for God's supernatural power. Pray for it. Whether it's a big thing like healing a person of a terminal illness or a little thing like helping you find your cell phone or keys or an amazing thing like bringing two people together for a lifetime partnership. Believe that God wants to do miracles in your life. Lord God, thank you for this miracle of Elisha. And we see that you are compassionate. You care about the little things in our lives and you, you care about our troubles. And that you have amazing power. And you want us to experience that. Jesus said we would. And so we pray we'd like to experience more of your supernatural power in our lives. I want you to pray right now. Uh, would you just tell God, what's the biggest thing going on in your life where you say, I don't know how to do this. And God, I need your supernatural power. Ask for it right now. You say, God, I need a miracle. It might be a big thing. It might be a, a small thing. But you pray right now. Lord God, thank you that you are a great God with supernatural power. You created the universe. When we invite you through Jesus into our lives, we can experience your supernatural power 